Hi guys and welcome back to another Dot Race video and today we're going to be playing MotoGP 22. We are going to be using Brad Binder on the KTM RC16 right here in Hareth and today we're going to have a 9 lap sprint race but we're also going to discuss the Grand Prix from yesterday which of course was the Angel Nieto circuit of Hareth. Now honestly one of the best races of the season, we are only 4 rounds in but still very much enjoyed it from uh, the beginning to the end but we have quite a bit to discuss to be quite honest with you because the man in front of us Fabio Quattararo found himself uh, in a bit of controversy over the weekend and I think it's still on the the mind of every single fan out there whether you're a Fabio fanboy or you're not a fan of the Frenchman at all I think we can all appreciate some penalties that were given this weekend were questionable let's be honest so speaking of Fabio Quattraro's penalty first, since he's right there on screen, I think that was a little bit unfair. Unfortunately for Fabio, he was in a situation where he caught himself between Marco Bezzecchi and uh, two other riders, well, himself and Miguel Oliveira, and it leaves him in a difficult situation to break into Michelin corner and leaves him in a perilous situation to unfortunately take out another rider after making contact with the rear of Bezzecchi's bike. For me, it was a racing incident and I really didn't see anything too egregious or anything really wrong with it. Riders have got to be aggressive when they qualify poorly and they've got to start trying to get the, the making the moves and making ground quicker rather than later. And unfortunately for Fabio, I think it was an unfair penalty and for him, it was unfairly treated. Now, regarding the long lap penalty which he took and unfortunately abused the limits. Now, a lot of people are saying that the, the stewards have gone crazy and have a vendetta against a Frenchman. I'm pretty much going to squash that right now because I do not think that's a thing. I, I mean, I'll be surprised, but I really don't think the former world champion has got such animosity toward, or at least the stewards have animosity towards him. I, I think that's a bit, uh, a bit asinine to think, really. I think it's a, it's a conspiracy more than anything else. But honestly, regarding the Lonat penalty, for me, you've got to stay within the rules. And the rules state that you must complete the long lap penalty by staying within track limits. Fabio did not stay within the track limits and therefore will be given another long lap penalty. The issue with the long lap penalty is that he probably, in my opinion and probably 90% of the fans, shouldn't have received the penalty in the first place. So that's what the issue is here. But unfortunately, the penalty has been given, he took it, accepted it, fine, it is what it is, and then abuse the track limits, so therefore has to do it again. I think regarding the penalty, regarding the issues of the weekend, I would say we need consistency. And we definitely need to start looking at the race overtakes. Fabio Quattararo's incident, fine. It is what it is. Rides were taken out. Miguel Oliveira is now injured. If someone's going to be the fall guy, I guess the stewards decided to put that blame on Fabio. What I don't understand is Pekka Banyaya's move on Jack Miller after Jack Miller opened the door and left it ajar. Pekka went for the lunge and then was given a penalty. So my question to you is after upon inspection, do you think that Pekka was given the penalty because of his gesture towards Miller where he was apologetic? Or do you think it, the stewards would have given that penalty regardless? Curious to hear what you guys think in the uh, comments section down below. I've uh, I've been discussing it with my mum, and uh, she's an, also a MotoGP fan, and she doesn't feel like there was anything to give in that one. And coming from her era of watching Valentino Rossi and some of the best boys in MotoGP, they wouldn't have been given penalties for the stuff like that. 2005, let's be honest, Valentino Rossi absolutely punted Saturday Gibbonet off the circuit, and there was no penalty given. If that happened in MotoGP now, we're looking at a race ban. And now as we go up on the inside with Brad Binder on Peko, we could be looking at a penalty ourselves now. <laughs> so what's going to happen regarding penalties in MotoGP? I do think this is going to be the calm before the storm. We will get eventually a really egregious penalty which upsets people. Fans are not going to be happy and neither will be the riders. I think once that occurs, we will get that consistency we need within the race direction and everything will be all hunky-dory. At least hoping so anyway. But regarding the race at the weekend, absolutely fantastic. Loved the sprint race. Moto3 was fantastic as ever. Moto2 was usually as it usually is, it was a bit boring, but I'm, I'm very happy that Sam Lowe's won. And then in MotoGP, that's where all the action was as well. So pretty good overall weekend. I don't think Hareth ever disappoints. 
You could say last year's race wasn't particularly interesting with Pecco defending against uh, Fabio. But ultimately for me, I very much enjoyed it. And I've gone wide here for turn one. That's a, that's a bit of a mistake. My apologies. I'm actually back onto my DualShock 4 controller for this video. I know I mentioned that uh, in yesterday's that I was going to change over to the DualSense. But honestly, I just don't think I can. <laughs> I don't think I can adapt to it. It's a bigger, bulkier controller. And I don't really enjoy holding it as much as I do with the PS4's DualShock 4 controller. It's just not quite as comfortable for me. And I didn't really like the controller overlay as much as the other one I have, so... Yeah, a few things to discuss, yeah, but uh, I'll figure it out with the controller, but... Ultimately, we needed to discuss MotoGP, and the man on the screen right now, Brad Binder. I just watched the sprint race again this morning and just had to revel at that beautiful braking display into the Pedroza corner. I've never seen a KTM or any MotoGP bike be pushed to that limit before. Yeah, we've seen Marquez push the absolute heck out of the RC213V Honda, but Brad Binder, it's so impressive. And the more you look at that move into turn six, it's just, it's stunning. It's a work of art. The South African is just brilliant. It's absolutely fantastic. And also, massive praise for not doing anything stupid in the final lap of the race. Yes, Banyaya had got it done. Banyaya had beaten uh, Brad Binder after leading for so long. And you know he would have wanted to go chuck it up on the inside, right on cue, as her peco to us there. And you know Binder would have wanted to throw it up on the inside. But he didn't. He was smart. He accepted that he was going to take second and got himself 20 crucial points in his championship challenge. And the bigger picture is for a world champion like uh, Brad Binder, he knows how to play the long game, so we could be looking at a KTM world champion this year. Can you imagine that? That would be something special. Ducati champion last year with Peko. Oh, Juan Mir's gone down ahead of the, uh, the grid there. And then um, we could get a KTM winning this year. That would be something else, it really would. But we'll have to see how the uh, longevity of the RC16 will be for the rest of the season. Now, as we just seen Juan Mir crash there, as I've gone a little bit off the circuit, we do need to discuss Juan Mir in, in some shape or form because he is having... Quite possibly the worst worst season of his career. This is dreadful for Joan Mir right now. He is not adapting to that Honda at all. And I don't think it's a talent issue. I just think that bike is either made for you or it's not. And I think no matter what you do to really attack it, I just don't think it's going to work. It's like the Ducati from, what, 2008, 9 and 10? Difficult to ride. No one enjoyed using it. Difficult to turn. I don't think it's going to go well for Joan Mir on the Honda. I hope I'm wrong. I really do. And I hope he bounces back and wrings the neck out of the RC, uh, excuse me, RC213V. But we'll we'll have to see, won't we? But uh, yeah, long run. Actually, I'm just trying to figure out here because we're. <laughs> I thought I'd catch up to the AI by now, considering I'm on power setting three. I started the race in power setting one, so I thought I'd be able to catch them up by now. But uh, an Air Bastion is doing a pretty solid job here. And of course, the Beast himself, unable to compete over at the weekend here in Jerez. His uh, mindset was simply, if he cannot score points, then there's no point in being there. And I understand that, but it's also a very negative way to look at it, because of course he's going to be gathering a lot of data, experience with the Factory GP23. Uh, but at the same time, reality is, that if he made a mistake, he could have sent himself into a much worse situation for the championship, and of course, a much worse position for him to try and capture all that feeling back with injuries and everything else. So, smart decision, really, from Bastianini. Of course, I want to see him out there. We all want to see the beast, but if he's injured, not much we can really do about it. So, yeah, let me know what you guys think of the Hareth Grand Prix. Give me some feedback. Let me know what your thoughts, any highs and lows that you wanted to discuss. No doubt we will be discussing the Fabio penalty and the uh, Peko incident as well. I really don't want to see penalties given every left, right and centre. And I think the penalty we haven't even discussed is Franco Morbidelli's. The one to start off all this weekend nonsense. The whole idea in that sprint race is to be aggressive, to go for it from the start, be gung-ho and try and take victory. That is the plan, that's what the MotoGP, that's what Dorna wanted to happen. They wanted excitement on Saturdays. Now we have it, riders are getting penalised for it. I really didn't think there was anything in that incident with uh, Franco Morbidelli, Alex Marquez, 
Marco Betts. Oh, Bassinini's gone down into turn one. Wow. I wasn't expecting that. I was actually pushing quite hard there to try and catch up to the beast. I guess uh, we put the pressure on him and we finally got the job done. But regarding Franco Morbidelli, there was a clear gap. Fabio Quattararo lifts up Alex Marquez. Alex Marquez opens up, allows Morbidelli a chance to go on through. And as Morbidelli tries to sneak on the inside, Marquez and him make contact. I don't think a penalty should have been given for that. If the result is because riders crashed and that's what the penalty's for, then I think that's just hard luck. I don't see really how a penalty could be done, and it's the same sort of slogan or phrase that's used to describe both Fabio Quattraro and Franco Morbidelli's incidents. The term ambitious. Ambitious is for me very ambiguous because define ambitious if you're the person who's on the outside. You're, this is a subjective view to claim someone was being ambitious. I, I can't imagine that Franco was ambitious and he didn't think that move would stick. He wouldn't have gone for it if he didn't think so. So that's a surprising one for me. If uh, if you guys want to give me a take on that one, I'm certainly keen to hear what you're going to say, but I don't know about that. I really didn't think the penalty had to be given. But what I did like was Franco Morbidelli's response to the whole penalty. All he was interested in was buying Takaki Nakagami a present for not absolutely running over him in the in the corner of turn two here in the Michelin corner for Jerez and goodness me more riders crashing down behind us. What a strange crashing going on in this Jerez Grand Prix. Have a look at the graphic in the bottom left hand corner of your screen there. There's riders still who haven't completed the previous lap. There's someone going into Ferrari and to Pelequi there. <laughs> the Crivier corner as well. What is going on? And now Bassini is down for a second time. This has been a rather strange GP, but uh, if you're looking forward to more MotoGP 22 content, be sure to hit the like and subscribe button. We do have a new championship coming out very, very soon. We're going to be using Marco Melange on the Kawasaki from 2009. We're going to be replicating that season, but also with a slight twist. We're going to be trying to rewrite history for a Kawasaki to win the MotoGP World Championship. But uh, yeah, what a weekend. Good stuff. I'm enjoying MotoGP 22 and I'll tell you what I am enjoying, being back on this controller. But what I do find fascinating is that our fastest lap time yesterday with Danny Pedrosa with the DualSense controller was a 136.7. I am only three tenths quicker with the DualShock 4. That's really left me wondering what I'm going to do now. It's, goodness me, I can't seem to stay on board the bike now. <laughs> I'm actually looking worse with the DualShock 4 now than I was with the DualSense. Now, the issue I have with this DualShock 4 controller, the PS4 controller, is that uh, the A button is a bit sticky. So when I try and hit the ride out device, it's not actually hitting it sometimes, which is kind of an annoyance, but it's not the end of the world. But just a little, quick look behind us as Marquez goes down into turn one. Fabio Quattararo is five tenths of a second within, beating us for the lead here. This has been a very interesting Grand Prix. Usually the AI and MotoGP 22 aren't very competitive. But this time, they're actually pushing me right to the end here. I mean, I'm liking this. This is fun. Could this be a wild finish? Could Fabio about to be launching a move into the Lorenzo corner? I guess we'll find out, but firm we go onto the brakes for turn six. I'm trying to replicate my best Brad Binder moment there by going really firm on the rear brake and sliding the KTM, but unfortunately, it doesn't quite work in the game. I really did spam the square button then to use the rear brake, but unfortunately, I just can't get that same angle that's what Binder did. Absolutely amazing to watch that. I'm going to have to watch it again in a bit, really. It was so good. If you're a Brad Binder fan, then you have a, a lot to be looking forward to this year. Just happened to get my hands on a Brad Binder t-shirt recently from MotoGP.com. So, count me in for being one of the fans of the South African. But now, here we go into the final part of the lap now for Ferrari. This is the final lap and this is the final corner of today's video again trying to slide it into the Lorenzo corner I just haven't got that skill but it's fine I enjoyed that very much and I hope you guys did too let me know in the comments section down below regarding MotoGP anything else you want to discuss and I guess that's it from me so guys thanks for watching the video I do hope you enjoyed if you did let me know in the comments section down below and be sure to discuss everything MotoGP 
be sure to hit the like button as well to help push the YouTube algorithm. And finally, hit subscribe. It does help out the channel, and I'd like to have you on board the team. And if you want to be a bigger part of the team, come and join the Dots Race Pit Crew. But upon that note, guys, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in tomorrow's video. Ciao for now. Oh, hi. Didn't quite see you there. Good to see you're still here. If this video didn't quite set your appetite, then why not watch some more Dot Race content by clicking the video shown on screen now. Furthermore, if you would like to follow me on social media, you can do so now with the links down in the description. Consider subscribing so you don't miss a single Dot Race video.